All right, let's call this meeting to order of the City Council for February 26th um, and uh, call to order. Miller? Yes. Williams? A? Yes. Weber? Yes. Briggs? Yes. And um, first thing up on our agenda is a presentation, Mr. Schlegel. Yes, uh, as part of our ongoing uh, departmental updates uh, this evening, we have Department of Public Safety, so Chief Mesco. Good evening, Council. As you know, my name is Bryce Mesco. I'm the Chief of Mexico Public Safety, and I'm going to be giving the department update for this year. The document you were given is our annual report for 2023. Um, I'm mostly going to be following that, but there are some things in there I'm not going to touch on, and then there's also some things I'm going to touch on that probably aren't in there. So if you look at that at any time and have questions, uh, you can always reach out to Mr. Slagle or me, and I'm sure we can get your questions answered. So, I just got to figure out. Ah, so I was going to touch brief briefly on our fleet of vehicles. Um, we now have 12 patrol vehicles instead of 11. That happened because uh, last year, actually last fiscal year, we put a new transmission in one of the cars under warranty. And then when we were going to trade it in, we weren't going to get anything out of it, the value we thought we would. We are now sending people to the academy pretty much constantly, um, every single academy class. So they're driving back and forth. So we felt it would be better for the fleet in general if we just used that car until it could be used no more and got people back and forth to Columbia that way. So other than that, the fleet is pretty much the same. We keep doing the trade-in value, which has kept us in, uh, or, the, or we kept doing the trade-in, which has kept us in a solid fleet of usable safe cars, and that's the most important thing. Uh, fire apparatus, as you guys know, uh, the end of 2022, we had a pretty rough, uh, extremely cold weather fire, damaged two of our engines. They are fully back in service. Everything's working again. And we actually did evaluate what happened there and um, maybe even some stuff that happened before the fire. And we've changed some of our cold weather, extreme cold weather responses. So hopefully we will not have something like that happen again. We still want to get the resources we need where we need them, but uh, we've kind of tweaked how we do that. And then that picture, that's our new stripe package. Any of the new patrol cars we're going to be getting um, will look like that. That came about this year. Seems to be fairly well received by the community and the officers and so that's what's going to be rolling around from that picture tell me what a hundred foot platform is it's our it's 213 it's a hundred foot ladder okay with a it's sorry it's an air I probably didn't explain it good enough it's uh it's our big fire truck okay. hundred foot ladder with a platform on it we used to have the bucket mm -hmm. and now it's just a platform okay so. Um, personnel, that's our most important resource. Um, if we're fully staffed, we'd have 34 commissioned officers, two non-commissioned employees, actually one of them only part-time, and then 10 volunteer firefighters. We are not fully staffed, haven't been for several years. That's not unique to us. Uh, we are currently five officers down, two volunteer firefighter positions short, but um, we're five officers down right now. Again, that's just profession-wide. It's workforce-wide. Everybody is struggling. Uh, the police profession really seems to be having a hard time recovering from our problems of the past. Um, good news is, when I was standing up here last year, I said in 22, we were only replacing people at the rate of two-thirds of a person for every person lost. 23, we were one for one. So every person that went out the door, we at least got one person in. So we didn't make ground. We also managed to tread water, so we'll take that as a positive, and we'll keep moving forward. So these are some pictures of the people we added in 23. On the left is uh, Zachary Woods, and on the right is Timothy Perkey. They both just got done with the Academy, so now they're doing the FTO program. In the middle is Austin Marks, who is just now starting the Academy. So it'll be a few months, and then we'll hopefully get something out of him. These are some other people we added this year. On the left is Dylan Burrow. He is a volunteer firefighter. And on the right is Glenn, um, I'm sorry, Nick Glenn, who is another volunteer firefighter. In the middle is a PSO, another officer we hired. It's Jackson Burks. Uh, we took these pictures when they were doing basic fire training so they didn't get to put their makeup on and look all pretty. But that's the people that we added this year. 
So how we spend our time, that's in there. Uh, so you can look at the numbers. Basically calls for service, we had about 12,700. That's when people pick up the phone and actually want us in their business. Um, dispatch counts, uh, 27,000. That includes the calls for service, but it also includes like traffic stops, follow up, any kind of self-initiated stuff that the officers are doing. So despite the fact that uh, we are a little short-handed, everyone is still running, everyone is still pushing as hard as they can to keep the big wheel moving. Um, the only number I would throw out there is our ambulance assists. Uh, it's about 2,000 for the year. I did just go back and look at some years past. Um, the hospital closing and we were running about six to seven hundred a year on those so you can see we're three times busier with that obviously that being gone the ER being gone has stressed the ambulance district out because no one just jumps in a car and drives to the hospital in town um, and we're right there with them we're trying to help them out so that's what we're spending some more of our time on uh, personnel conduct reports, that's kind of how we track people, commendations, inquiries, or allegations of misconduct. Um, so you can see the numbers and, and kind of what each category is. The number, the row, which now I see my coloring's probably poorly done, it might be hard to see, but where it says sustained or other misconduct. So that's basically when somebody complains about something we did, and if we find out that in fact they were right and we messed it up, right? So it's great if that number is zero all the time, as you can see it's not. Um, it's hard to do everything perfectly all the time. So this year we did have uh, two sustained allegations of misconduct. Uh, we address those. We can address them through disciplinary actions, training, supervision, maybe tweaking a policy. Um, but we did that, so hopefully we are a little bit better now than we were the year before in what we do. Uh, the goal is, is to take care of these problems before they become newsworthy or lawsuit worthy. Use of force, it's our policy that we only use force to um, for people's safety or to take people into custody and we only use the force necessary to accomplish either of those goals. So this is our use of force from 2023 and it's compared to the previous couple of years. Um, very comparable, we actually had the same number of incidents and all of the incidents, all of the actions that the officers took were found to be within policy. Um, you can see there was more officers involved than before but the same number of incidents. Um, that just means there were more officers on scene, more officers getting involved than there were in the previous years. But that's actually a good thing. Um, I think the more people we have around when things are going wrong, uh, the better and the safer it is for everyone involved. What's a typical incident? An incident, that's just any time we use force. So if we arrest somebody and it turns into a fight, that's an incident. So, and then it was broken down. I don't know if I can go backwards. I don't know if I want to try that, but um, it was broken down by what the incident, what force we use. Sometimes it's just physical force, hands-on. It can be our OPNs, it can be OC or, or MACE. It can be um, um, actually drawing down and having the gun pointed at them, which a lot of agencies don't count that unless you discharge the gun but we've always taken the stance that uh, if that's the case, you're within an inch of making a life and death decision, so we do keep track of those as well. So. Okay, thank you. No problem. If, if you draw a gun on someone, if the, if the officers draw a gun, is that usually where they're th pretty threatened by the person? Or yeah, the, that's or when... Or they're threatening someone else with real, real harm. Sure. That goes back to when we say our policy is, and you know, use of force can be a dicey thing that all departments talk about. There's, we could debate that probably the rest of the night, but uh, we only are trying to use the amount of force necessary to accomplish our goals. So uh, when we got your gun out and pointed at somebody, like I said, you're within an inch of maybe making a life and death decision. So whatever is going on and whatever you're trying to accomplish is that has probably been necessary. So that kind of answer? Yeah. All right. But All right. I, did, I didn't see that you listed any place where there were uh, firearms discharged. We did not, no, we didn't this year. We no. did not uh, shoot anybody or shoot at anybody. Uh, that? That's good. <laughs> that is good. Uh, so NIBRS reportable crimes. I've cried about NIBRS in the past. Uh, it's just kind of the, the crimes that every agency in the country is kind of supposed to keep track of. Um, 
you've got all the numbers in there and I won't bore you with all of those. Our total though, total 432 reportable crimes in 2023. That was more than the previous year. It was more than any time in those previous four years. So that doesn't look the best, right? We don't like that. Um, we'd love to keep those numbers as low as possible some just some context in all of that we didn't have any homicides so yay that's that's a great thing we only had one robbery which that's a great thing and we actually did clear that we solved that there's a couple guys in jail now for that um, other other insights into those numbers so our thefts larcenies whatever we're gonna call them 22% of those are Walmart shopliftings. That's not to say anything good or bad about Walmart. It's just saying that that is the single largest source from that number. So um, whatever that means as you look at that. Um, where we took it on the chin was our burglaries. They were up by 20, they were up 23, which is 49%. Um, as a matter of fact, if they hadn't gone up, we'd have been very comparable to last year. Um, what that was, was storage unit thefts. We were getting hit hard in 23 with people breaking into storage units and taking stuff out of them the good news is is around in the fall September ish October ish we finally um, made some breaks we've got some cases going through the court right now with some people we've got a gentleman who was part of the group whose uh, parole has been revoked he's back in in prison so so far those have not been those have been curtailed some for this year and hopefully 2024 looks better in that aspect I did uh, get sentimental and do some of the good old days stuff you know you always feel like things are better in the good old days and I went and looked at some of our old reports and I actually went back I tried to look at 2004 and then that annual report had a 10-year uh, window there and so yeah when you look at from 95 to 2004 our our average number of those crimes was 414 and of those 10 years five of those years were more than 432 which is where we sit now so I'm not saying that to to say you know we don't have work to do we aren't going to try to do better on that kind of stuff and get those numbers down I'm just saying that you know the sky's not falling we're not a, like a horrible place uh, to live and be in, not any worse than 30 years ago so. Are those the sexual assaults, domestic violence type? No, unfortunately. <laughs> those are um, domestic violence stuff's going to be generally fall under domestic assaults, which is going to be in the, if they're aggravated, fall into assaults. Okay. So, any further? Okay. So, traffic crashes. Um, Last year I stood here and said, hey, we had 240 traffic crashes. That was pretty good. I don't know that I, we can repeat that because I wanted to keep expectations low. Um, but look, we went and did it. We had a very similar year to what we had in 2022. The number that really stinks and really sticks out is the number killed. We did have three people die in traffic crashes in 2023. Um, which is far from what we want. The goal of keeping the traffic crashes down and the severity down is so that that number stays zero. Um, one of those crashes... Were those, were those on the bypass? I was actually getting ready to say. Um, one of those... Sorry. No, you're fine. One of those crashes... Um, was on South Clark Street. One car crash, vehicle just drove off the road. It appeared that the driver had a health-related issue. That's what caused the crash, and that's what caused his death, as opposed to like some traumatic injury from the crash. Um, that still counts as a fatal crash if they died in the crash. So um, the other two deaths were on the bypass, which I was actually gonna touch on a little more in a little bit, but that was one crash that was out on the bypass and it involved two people dying. Why do we have so many accidents on the bypass? What's the deal? That's so well, you are totally, I've got a whole slide devoted to that. And I could actually ramble about that a long time too, but I know you guys want to get out of here at some point in time. But actually, yeah, I was going to get get to that in a little bit. if Because okay. if, uh, that's a, actually a very personal thing for me and, um, and a pretty good topic. So, um, but to keep glossing over the other stuff, on our fire responses, you see we had more fire calls than we did the previous several years. Uh, we did not have more structure fires, though, than we've had um, in the previous years. Uh, most of the increased calls, there were some increased gas line breaks, which are leaks. Uh, there were some increased 
gasoline spills, which are spills, um, where it seemed like we kind of got smacked around a little bit different than other years was natural cover fires, grass fires, etc. Everybody knows all of 23 was pretty dry, I think. Heck, probably in February, we all started crying about how dry it was and it went throughout the whole year. So we had things lighten off much easier than it had years past. Uh, but we got that taken care of. We also were audited by ISO uh, in 23, which is Insurance Services Office, I believe. Um, ISO rates fire departments, they come along every five years, sometimes it's closer to eight years, but they come along and they rate your fire department uh, between one and 10, the lower the number, the better. Um, then they give that number to insurance companies and if insurance companies want to, they can use that to adjust, uh, adjust rates in that community. Um, did you? Go ahead. Okay, so uh, we currently sit as an ISO rating of four. Um, since I've been here, we, we were a five, then we went to a six, then we went back to a five, then we've been a four, and then we were a four again on the repeat. Um, but we were just barely a four uh, last time. I do not know, I do not know where we're gonna sit when this comes out. I will tell you at least by the old numbers that uh, if we were a four by the old numbers, we would be in the top 30% of fire departments in the country as far as their ratings go. If we are a five, we'd be in the top 46% of fire departments in the country by their numbers. Um, either way, I think we're, we're pretty solid. I would be remiss uh, if I didn't just touch base. We did have a fatality fire this year on Jackson Street. It was pretty rough. Um, uh, I will say that what the crews did during that fire trying to get to the victim was pretty darn impressive. Uh, haven't seen stuff like that pulled off in a long time. It just didn't work out. Or actually, I'll say ever. Haven't seen it pulled off ever. So no matter what our number comes out being, uh, we, we're doing some pretty impressive stuff on the fire side right now, actually. Um, but that's we'll find out in about a month where we sit on the number. So the lower rating, the better, is that right? Yep. Okay, thank you. No problem. So, um, training, hours, uh, public relations stuff. Uh, we always got to do training. Uh, so we've did, had over 3,000 hours of training for these officers. Police was about 1,600 hours total. Fire was about 1,400 hours total. I've got some examples and stuff broken down in that um, annual report. Uh, it does not count going to the academy. It does not count uh, the FTO hours when someone's trained when we first bring them on. We do a lot of public relations and public education stuff. I did not accurately keep those numbers. Numbers. I've got some examples of stuff we do in that annual report. Um, public education stuff, we do a lot of public relations stuff. Some of the stuff these officers are doing on their own time, too. So um, that makes it, I mean, I still keep track of the numbers, but I don't have them to throw out. These are ju just some examples. So um, on the left is fire extinguisher training. We do fire extinguisher training for a lot of entities they ask us to, where we just basically show them how to safely and effectively operate fire extinguishers so maybe we don't have to come or do anything better we can come and not do anything because that's best but uh, uh, on the right is safety town we've been part of safety town forever and we continue to be and that seems to be well received teaching pre-kindergartners various safety things and then in the middle those are three guys that graduated the Academy this year they are now they've actually completed their FTO process and they are out now rolling around and trying to save the world on their own uh, so topics that we've been hit with, um, I'll just start on the right. Last year, homelessness took, uh, got a different face in Mexico, I think. It, it began looking different than it had in the past, it looked more similar to uh, what we see in larger communities. That was not a trend just for Mexico, that was a trend all across the country and even in communities smaller than ours. And we've talked, we talked about that some in, the, uh, in prior council meetings, I think. So Mexico does have some resources now in the transitional housing on Summit. That is not just a shelter where people can go and uh, 
and stay whenever they feel like it. It is designed to give people a place to stay while they get on their feet and until they get on their feet and teach them how to get on their feet so they can have more permanent housing solutions. So that's a good thing. The Arthur Center started what's called an ERE, Emergency Room Enhancement, which is basically like a, a kind of a caseworker who gets a hold of people and tries to get them whatever the resources they need to get in a better life situation. So what did public safety do? We just got out there and hustled. We um, did what we were calling kind of secluded area patrols, looking in areas where maybe you can't see it as easily from the roadway. And um, we uh, tried to prevent large encampments from happening or large problems from happening in certain areas, in any areas we could find. Um, we investigated complaints if someone called and said, hey, people are going in this vacant house. We'd try to get that stopped uh, before it became a squatting situation. Uh, when we'd come across people who wanted to make their situations better, we would do resource referral, which is those transitional housing and the ERE program or anything else we could come up with. And we'd try to help people who wanted to help themselves get what they needed. If we did not, if we came across people who did not want to make their situation better, we did have laws we were enforcing and we would make arrests for various things um, and try to make the situation better for the community as a whole. It did seem like maybe we had an impact. We'll see what happens as 2024 comes along. We'll keep, keep doing our thing and try to make that better. Uh, then drugs. Drugs are something that every community talks about all the time. In Fourth of July, we did have a teenager overdose, from, die of a fentanyl overdose, which kind of shook the community. Um, we did uh, investigate that incident, and that led to uh, two cases being sent to the juvenile office for teenagers who were distributing. It also, we worked with the East Central Drug Task Force and with some other information they had, ended up leading to a search warrant in town, getting an, an adult arrested for his part he played in any distributing that was going on there. And then um, kept working it back up the chain towards Columbia. East Central Drug Task Force is working with Mustang Task Force. Um, just staying deep in that chain, um, cutting off any branches they can find. So that's how we're trying to help the community through enforcement. You see that in 2023, we, did, we made public safety itself, the officers made 33 drug arrests. East Central Drug Task Force made 17 in Audrain County. They had 42 cases, but not every case they use as an arrest because sometimes they uh, work with people trying to go after maybe the bigger fish. And then ACCORD was started this year. That stands for Audrain County Coalition on Reducing Drugs. And that was actually spearheaded by the health department. Um, but there's a lot of entities that are involved. I probably won't be able to name them all. Arthur Center's deep in it, CMCA, um, Oh shoot! Well, us and the Audrey and the oh, public schools and the prosecuting attorney's office, we're all deep in it, uh, trying to make our community a little more re resistant, maybe, and resilient. Um, that's going to have to do with public education and maybe trying to get to people and getting them into rehab if they're willing. Uh, before it becomes an arrest or before it becomes an overdose. So that's what we've been doing on that front. And then, because so many people oh, want to know, pleasure. the bypass, right? Can we roll back? Yeah. Oh, shit. Roll it. Roll it. <coughs> um, there you go. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Ah. Yes, sir. How many, uh, so how many complaints, do you know the number of complaints that you investigated on homeless? Um, I don't. Um, and I know, yeah, I know some people were calling you like the same time as they were calling us or sometimes even before us. Are you talking about like vacant houses and stuff? I just think on um, this incidents with the use of the homeless people, how how much times? Uh, uh, sorry, that's a great question and I should have known. Going to the complaints uh, with that, I, it's no big deal. Um, here's another question I have because I go about every day smelling it, so I just kind of wonder. And um, marijuana, have we kind of just, has America just kind of <laughs> looked past it? I mean, and I, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying you need to arrest people, but nope. since we passed the law and legalized it, it seems like, uh, I, you know, I probably shouldn't smell it where I work, but right. I do. Right. And uh, I, and really, I mean, 
is it worth even investigating anymore? Is, a, um, is it a waste of resources to even, well, I guess if you pull somebody over and you smell it, you know. Yeah, if, you, if you're an adult, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Kids, yeah, it does. Um, and yeah, so you're talking about where you work and stuff. Obviously yeah. that's, and we, you know, the schools are great about working on that. The SROs are trying to do their thing, and we actually send quite a few cases over. The only marijuana cases we will we send to court have to do with juveniles. Um, so yeah, it's much akin to to alcohol now as far as public perception. Right. So um, yeah, that's that's what we're working with. And yeah, I could go on about that too. Actually, one of the most recent juvenile pops, they were uh, yeah, it was amazing that that kid. He was actually mad that he got in trouble and he said this stuff doesn't really work anyway why are you guys on me about this and and uh yeah so that's kind of the attitude the general attitude so well there was a there was a call by a parent that wanted it back because it was there they were <laughs> stolen from. and you're going mm -hmm. yeah yeah once it's evidence it's evidence <laughs> i don't know, know what to tell you so. You know. so. so yep that's where we sit so then the bypass. Uh, yeah, so. That's from, I'm sorry, what? No, I was just asking. Oh, okay, so from 20, 2003 to 2013, in that 10 year time span, we had one person die on the bypass. Uh, from 2013 till now, we're averaging about a person a year on the bypass. If you want to dial in the microscope closer from the past five years, we've had three crashes and six fatalities on the bypass. Um, more so the bypass is four miles long ballpark and all the crashes where people are dying are occurring in a similar fashion and they're all occurring in the same one to two mile uh, stretch of road um, so we and and actually public works drew wilford's been um, great help on that i'd stroke him now that he's not around but uh so we've been talking to modot pretty hard um and that's where he's been really helpful and uh, modot's been receptive to any kind of conversations and we've had a few meetings we've gathered some data we've debated each other's data and even as recently as last week we had what's called a road safety audit an rsa that's a modot term uh, uh, which involved Drew Williford, Major Thompson from Public Safety, and myself from the city, and then five different people from MoDOT, five different little areas of MoDOT. And we were all comparing notes and areas we felt like we were experts in. And um, all the evidence indicates that these deaths aren't from speeding. They're high speed crashes, but not excessive speeding. All the evidence indicates it's not from speeding, it's not from passing, it's not from the weather, it's not from lighting, it's not from the sight lines, and it's not from people thinking they are still on a four lane road. Those are the common things that are thrown out there and, and really evidence indicates none of those are true. What it appears is these fatality crashes are uh, inattentive driving for whatever reason and the driver crosses the center line, drifts across the center line in that section of roadway, and uh, it's a fatal mistake. Uh, because generally the driver that drifts, I think almost all, uni well, yeah, universally the driver that has drifted, we haven't been able to talk to afterwards. Um, so uh, the consensus after the RSA is that center line rumble strips would be the solution for that section of roadway. The the uh, good news is, or the thing is, is MoDOT has bought into centerline rumble strips on Highway 54 when it's been in the two-lane section, starting at the east city limits of Mexico and on out. There's centerline rumble strips on 54, so they really just need to finish this last four-mile section and and call it a day. Um, the good news is, is relatively speaking for the budgets they have, I can't speak for them, but it's not deal breaking expensive. So it doesn't have to become one of their little, I think they call them stips, kind of their equivalent like a, a capital outlay type thing. It doesn't have to be one of those. They indicated they could just take care of it with their like line item type things, maintenance budgets, like striping, fixing potholes, stuff like that. Just like every agency, they stress about their budget and what inflation's gonna bring and all the demands that everybody has. So basically after that RSA, they indicated they they did wanna do it, they did wanna get it taken care of. 
we were just going to have to evaluate it quarter by quarter, um, financial quarter by quarter for them, and see when they could produce the money. So, or get it on their list of projects. So, probably still something we want to pay attention with and stay in communication with them on but they have indicated every statement every meeting has ended with they want to make sure that we all know that they want to work with us and get things taken care of because you know it's I mean they started in 2021 they started the show me zero campaign which was supposed to be a collaborative effort to make zero fatalities on the roadway so we've got a pretty rough two mile section of roadway here that could probably use some attention so really though the positive is is that's just another example of the city all of us working together with other agencies trying to make all of Mexico safer um, overall and that is the end of what I was going to So, Bryce, do. are you saying that the state, is, I mean, the, the highway department is saying that even though we've had an increase in deaths on that 54 segment, that they're not paying it, like, considering that sort of extra motivation for getting it done? I think they are considering it extra motivation because because prior to us having these discussions, there was no interest in doing that. Um, so yes, I think most assuredly they want to get it done, or they see the need to get it done. Uh, now it's just a matter of when they're going to seeing the get need it. and getting it done. Correct. Should be the same. <laughs> well, yeah. So, so again, yeah, I can talk for a long time, much more than anybody wants me to, I'm sure. So, okay. I want to go back to your right at the beginning of when you started. Oh, okay. Ta talking. Okay. And you were talking about retention of officers, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you were saying that we now can replace if we lose someone, we usually can replace them. That's a one-on-one -on -one situation, right? Mm -hmm. Did I hear that right? Yes. Do you are, are there any is there anything that uh, we need to be aware of uh, that uh, <clears throat> excuse me I'm just sorry I just don't yeah, have a no. voice is there anything we need to be especially aware of as far as to make sure we are retaining our good officers and we are attracting good people to become officers or anything particular at the top of your list that could be done to help that situation yeah I'd say anybody you know tell them hey apply a public safety if you can so uh, um, we're working on that's what we've been working on and the council actually has been great city overall has been great you guys know a couple of years ago we were doing a lot of evaluation of our salaries and stuff um, I think we tripped across a pretty solid formula to keep us competitive and that's actually what stopped sort of the hemorrhaging I believe um, and there's always going to be turnover in every profession and and we have chosen not to lower our standards I forgot to say even that I, I don't think I said we only hired 29 percent of the people who applied with us last year some PDs are trying the whole hey let's just throw everybody in and see what works out we have felt like that's just kicking the can down the road for trouble later so um, I think the city overall has been doing great I think the officers overall feel supported um, we will just keep on plugging away and and try to have a solid environment to stop people from leaving and then yeah anything we can do get the word out I, I yeah, will uh, that was what we'll we were having a problem with we were training them and then off they'd go someplace else. sure that yeah that's a thing and you know concern. we're pretty cutthroat police agencies are we're we're shanking each other every time we get a chance so uh, that will happen again you know all the agencies you know Columbia's crying like a fiend that they're 20 percent 25 percent down something like that so they will make adjustments they will try to steal people um, and yeah, we'll just keep going back and forth, and okay. hopefully, hopefully, we come out the winners though. That's right. That's because they should have hired a bunch of officers years ago. Sure, 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 sure. And then so. Columbia blew up. Well, truth, yeah, truth be told, <laughs> you know, that's what we're talking about. You know, we don't want to get. It's harder to rebuild than to just stay maintain, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. You see in your recruiting, you need to talk about Columbia's shooting ratio compared to number of officers to our shooting <laughs> ratio to officers. And maybe that'd be I'll be sure to do that. We'll see where this goes. So. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. All right. Hey, Chief. Yes, sir. Uh, you said you hired 29% of the applicants. I used to believe that I kind of think it's easy for me here, but if there's 71% of the applicants that we don't hire, what are two or three reasons that we don't hire? What are the first things you call children? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it's kind of on a, now, you know, we don't have the number, we don't have like hundreds of applicants a year either. So, um, I, I mean, it kind of is a little case by case. Ba I mean, we've, we've tripped across people that, you know, they don't, they're, they don't really, they just don't, we give a psych test, for example, as part of our selection process. And sometimes that can raise some red flags uh, when we're doing our background checks and talking to their references and looking at, uh, you know, some people, they're local and we've actually dealt with them a lot ourselves. Um, so it can be a variety of reasons, just it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it would be a good long-term fit. Okay. All right. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. Okay, moving on. We have not approved our minutes. Do I have a motion? <coughs> Move we approve the minutes of February 12th. Second. Miller? Yes. Hay? Yes. Weber? Yes. Griggs? Yes. All right, under resolutions, item five, we go to resolutions. Uh, these require only one reading by title only in passage. Uh, the first one is bill number 2024-6. It's to uh, authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with Plan B Development. Mr. Schlegel. Yes, Your Honor. Um, we have a uh, general maintenance agreement with uh, Plan B. Uh, this is our on-call for services. We've had it uh, a number of years. Um, but it was our time to go back out and rebid and really look at uh, what was out there. And we've done that. And to cover the details, we're going to turn to Greg Sewell. Greg is in our engineering department. Uh, uh, Drew is a little under the weather today, so Greg is uh, filling in. Yeah, good evening, Council. Uh, the City of Mexico maintains a general maintenance agreement for on-call services to provide for various maintenance services on an hourly basis. Services include sanitary sewer collection, system repairs, concrete pavement replacement, storm sewer repairs, support of snow operations, and other various tasks as needed. The contract will function as an on-call basis, which the contractor will be able to respond to emergency work in 24 hours a day. A request for a proposal, RFP, was advertised in the Mexico Ledger, placed on the city website, and an email list of potential bidders on file for the city's Mexico Public Works Department. One response was received from Plan B Development from Mexico, Missouri. Plan B Development is a current on-call contractor. With the contract uh, expiring February 29th, 2024, the city has experienced exceptional performance with Plan B Development. And Plan B development has demonstrated positive partnership, quality workmanship, reliability, along with prompt response times. So review of the rates submitted um, deemed responsible no change in rates compared to the prior contract agreement. Staff recommends council proceed with run reading by title only and patches of the attached resolution, excuse me, resolution authorizing city manager to enter a contract for various maintenance services with Plan B development. I move for reading Bill 2024-06. Second. Miller? Yes. Hay? Yes. Weber? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Bill number 2024-06, a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement with Plan B development for the city's on-call maintenance service. I move for passage of Bill number 2024-06. Second. Miller? Yes. Hay? Yes. Weber? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Go to the next one. Yeah, for the next one. We can go to the next one. Okay. Uh, bill number 2024-07 is we need, we have a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a letter of intent with Crown London Service. Mr. Schlegel. Uh, yes. Um, over the years, we have budgeted for and, and done partnerships with uh, improving sidewalks, and this particular one is in downtown. Uh, this is a partnership with them to get the sidewalks repaired, and if you've seen pictures of this sidewalk, it needs repaired. It does. And uh, to cover the details of this particular project, uh, once again, Greg Sewell. Yeah. So, as stated, the city is interested in partnering with downtown business to improve sidewalks. Within our downtown district, Crown Linden Services has approached with the cost share proposal to excuse me to improve sidewalks along the south side of West Promenade Street and along the east side of South Washington Street, all being adjacent to Crown Linden, have an approximate length of 265 feet. Um, the project known as the 2024 Crown Linden Sidewalk Improvement Project will be entered into a reimbursement basis only. Crown Linden Services will be responsible for paying the contractor, which is Shane Owen. 
construction and submit proof of payment for review and processing. A pre-construction meeting was held downtown on February 16th, 2024. Well, excuse me, with the representatives from City General Contractor and Crown Land Services, intending construction specifications, ADA requirements were all outlined. The city received a signed letter of intent from Crown Linen, outlining the agreement. The letter of intent requests the city pay $13,345. On a total construction bid of 31290 the scope of work includes excavation of the existing brick pavers, uh, replacement of six inches of concrete, additionally new concrete driveway approach, remove old abandoned sidewalk planter boxes, and then new ADA compliant side, uh, curb ramp. The 2023-2024 budget allows 35000 from capital improvement sales tax for sidewalk accessibility projects throughout the city limits. This is the first expenditure from this line item. So, staff recommends council proceed with the reading by title only and passage of the attached resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a letter of intent with Crown Lane Services. Um, we're responsible for a percentage. Yes. Yes. It uh, part of its percentage. The other thing is, is that for example, a good portion of it is uh, such as the ADA ramps, corners, uh, things of that nature. So we would be responsible parts of it anyway. And um, this is a partnership that we've uh, same process we've used in others. Oh, okay. I was just I was so they obtained the bid or whoever they want to do it. And so, and we review and those bids. Okay, so we're only there was there was approximately like I want to say three to four bids that were submitted to Crown Linen. Okay, I was just looking at that sheet of paper. Right. I move for first reading of bill number twenty twenty four oh seven. Second. Miller. Yes. Hey. Yes. Weber. Yes. Thank you, Greg. Briggs. Yes. Bill number 202407, a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a letter of intent with Crown Linen Service Incorporated for the 2024 Crown Linen Sidewalk Improvement Project. I move for passage of bill number 202407. Miller? Yes. Hay? Yes. Weber? Yes. Greg? Yes. Okay, thank you, Greg. I hope you get to feel better. Thank you. Okay, other business. We have a staff report on the purchase of a compact truck loader for the forestry brush grinding department. Mr. Schlegel. Yes, this is a replacement piece of equipment. Um, we've got uh, some bids and to cover the bids for this particular one, Chad Schmidt. Thank you, Bruce. Good evening. The 2023-24 annual budget allows $100,000 for the purchase of a compact track loader for the forestry department. Uh, the trade-in for this uh, purchase is a 2008 John Deere uh, CT332, which was uh, originally the street department's uh, loader. Um, City of Mexico is a member of the cooperative purchasing uh, um, group, Sourcewell. Um, so we solicited quotes from Martin Equipment of Columbia, Missouri, and Seidenstricker Nobi Partners of Mexico, uh, who are also members of the purchasing cooperative. Uh, and the following bids you see below. Uh, were the results Martin Equipment um, with a trade-in of $23,500 had a bid of $73,732. Uh, Seidenstrick and Nobi Partners uh, here in Mexico had um, a trade-in of $20,000 for a um, final purchase price of $72,945, which is a better price. Um, staff recommends that council approve the purchase of the 331G compact track loader from Seidenstrick and Nobi Partners for the price $72,945.10, subject to the bidder's ability to, to deliver in an acceptable amount of time. This is this exact same two things. They were they both bid on the same thing, right? Yeah. So um, Sourcewell is a uh, they get a guideline out of a federal contract that says you have to sell it for this or less. They can still go as low as they want to on the on the pricing. They can't go above that number. Did I have a so uh, there will be another. Th there's going to be another one of these come up for the street department um, okay. in a two or weeks, four weeks, or whatever, um, and it's going to be exactly flipped. And it's all about the trade-in value, uh, you know, of the machine you have to trade in. Did we purchase something that we pre-approved that you're waiting for a used for the forestry? 
That was the uh, that was the lift. Okay. Uh, that we eventually we ended up having to cancel that first order because okay. they came back and they said they wanted more money before they would deliver it, and we were like, no. And we did buy a used piece of equipment last year, last budget year. Yeah. I was just trying to get things. Yep. I move for the purchase of the 30, 331G compact track loader from Size Trigger Partners in Mexico for $72,945.10. Second. Miller? Yes. Hay? Yes. Weber? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Okay, next item on the agenda is appointments to the Land Clearance Redevelopment Authority. Mr. Schlegel. Uh, yes, Your Honor. This is a, uh, a five-member board. Uh, we need to uh, fill these uh, vacancies by council appointment. Uh, one of the positions of uh, historically been city employee appointed, uh, city employee to be appointed to the board. It is recommended that uh, city manager I be appointed to fill that position. Uh, Martin Keller is the only current member that's still on the board, and he did express interest in reappointment. We have also received applications from Iona Shivers, Jim Medley, and Louis Milan to be appointed. So um, if council wishes to do those, I would suggest one that we do the Martin Keller appointment because it's a reappointment separate. And then we can do the others, um, but we would have to designate which terms because they would all be terms that would expire. Two of them in 25, one in 27, and one in 26. I move we reappoint Martin Keller to the Land Clearance Redevelopment Authority. Second. Miller? Yes. Haig? Yes. Weber? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Okay. Again, we can do the rest of these, but you have to just. But you'd have to designate to which term. So you'd have to do like. I move to appoint Iona Shivers to the, let's put her on 2027 date for the Land Clearance Redevelopment Authority. Second. And we can do the other one, we can do the we'll other, do we could, you could name all of them at the same uh -oh. motion, that's fine. Yeah, I move to appoint Jim Medley to the 2026 term for the Land Clearance Redevelopment Authority and Louis Milan to the 2025 term for the Land Clearance Authority. And that would still leave a vacancy. That didn't live. Second. Would be pointing myself to that one. Okay, gotcha. Oh, you need it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I move to approve or appoint the city manager, I guess, for 2025 one? Okay. 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 It's a short one. You never know how long he's going to be around. <laughs> well, it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird that we have to sit on the board and we have to. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it's, it's a. <laughs> I have a motion second. from Haig. I have a second from Miller. Miller. Yes. Haig. Yes. Weber. Yes. Briggs. Yes. Okay. With that being. I understand. <laughs> Okay. We can approve the claims. I move we pay the bill. Oh, did you say it? Mm -hmm. Second. I thought. Miller? Yes. Hay? Yes. Weber? Yes. Briggs? Yes. All right, now it's time for our council comments. And uh, Steve, you want to start? I'll do it. Uh, just a couple things. Uh, the pool slide looks good. Uh, can't wait till the mayor shoots down it when it's ready to roll. And uh, <laughs> Chad, sad to hear you leaving us. And uh, we wish you the best of luck. And we thank you for all that you have done for uh, the city of Mexico. I know it is not an easy job. Um, it's got stuff. You know, making sure that uh, I know people think that we have an unlimited checkbook that we just write it and it's, it's going to happen in those parks. But I appreciate what you've done and and uh, wish you the best of luck moving forward. Chris? Me? Well, he hit everything that I was going to say. I went and looked at the pool slide yesterday, and uh, it's looking oh, it's terrific. pretty pretty sharp out there. And it will be interesting to see. Oh, I'm yeah, see your slide sure. down that. <laughs> <Great. laughs> and and also, Chad, good luck in your new whatever Thank you. prospects. And glad you glad you served us for. 
21 years, is that right? Yeah, a little more, yeah. yeah 22 years yeah, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I'll still be in Mexico, so. Oh, we thought we'd get rid of you. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have. Uh, Chad, I'm sure we'll we'll try to find something special to do for you. But I I want to I want to say that the one thing that when I came on the council was really what an interest to me was that pool, with getting that new, uh, getting rid of the old pool, and and building that new uh, aquatic center. And it got done, yeah. and it got done. And you put so much time and effort in it, and I will not forget that. So thank you so much for that. Anyway, Mr. Mr. Slate, Mr. Larry, Larry, I keep forgetting you're on that screen up there. That's all right. I have to forget up here until I get out of those off maps. Um, Mr. Chan, I want to congratulate you and thank you also. You did a great job. Yeah, I got a question. I guess the chief was supposed to go there, I assume. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I've got a thought for him. Uh, for the department, I, I, this is not a shot at the sheriff's department. I think the sheriff's department does a great job. I think Sheriff Otto does a real fine job. I have no problem with whoever. I think they also do a really nice job of telling us what they've done, and I think they should. I have no problem with that. I'm wondering if we can figure out some way to do that also. I think it's important that the public know some of these things that, that you guys do, rather than catch all the heck you see the tits out and from, from some of the experts on Facebook Okay, uh, we'll move on to public comments. If you have something to say publicly to the council, step forward, state your name, state your address, and you have three minutes. Okay. Move we adjourn. Second. Miller? Yes. Hank? Yes. Weber? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Thank you.